we're going to look at John's Gospel and just do half of John's Gospel and finish it off next week. So let's just see very briefly um, who was John. And Mark chapter 1 verses 19 to 20 tells us that John was the brother of James, the sons of Zebedee, who when Jesus called them by the Sea of Galilee, left the hired servants in the boat with their father, left their nets and went out and followed Jesus. It's Mark chapter 1 verses 19 to 20 and James and John, this John here had seemed to have very fierce tempers, they were called the sons of thunder. They wanted, if you remember, to bring thunder and lightning and fire down upon a, an unbelieving city. That was John. But sanctifying grace is so great that this John finally wrote the first epistle of John as an old man. And there's a story, which is not in the Bible, that says that as an old man, he used to be carried into the church on a stretcher when he was too old to walk. And when he was too old almost to speak, he would just repeat over and over again to his congregation, little children, love one another. Little children, love one another. So the love of God had conquered and captivated this fiery young fisherman called John who wished to call coals of fire down upon an unbelieving city. That's who John was. That John, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, full of fire, the writer of the epistles of John and the writer of the book of Revelation, all the same person, fiery in youth, but having known Christ for perhaps 60 years as an old man, little children love one another, little children love one another. Why did he write in chapter 20, verses 30 to 31, the key verse of John's Gospel. But these are written, so he's going to tell us why he's written. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. He writes John's Gospel that folk may believe. If you want to think of it this way, John in his Gospel says, believe. John in his epistle says, love. John in the book of Revelation says, wait. Wait for the coming of Jesus. Wait, love, and believe. You might believe what? You might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And John's purpose in writing his gospel was to present Jesus as the Son of God, his divinity and eternity. Matthew, the King to the Jews. Mark, writing about the servant, writing to the Gentiles. Luke, writing to those Greeks about Jesus, the ideal man. And now John also, it is thought, writing to Greeks. Jesus, the Son of God. That you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but believing for John was no academic matter, but that your belief in Jesus might bring you eternal life. Not just intellectual assent, but heart reception is New Testament belief. New Testament belief is never mere intellectual assent, it is always intellectual assent plus heart reception. So we have Jesus, therefore, pictured here as the Son of God. When did John write? He wrote as an old man near the end of his life, somewhere between 90 and 100 AD, the last of the Gospels to be written. One of the last books in the whole of the New Testament to be written. John was the only one of the Eleven disciples who wasn't martyred. He was, you remember he was exiled on the island of Patmos for his faith, where he wrote the book of Revelation. He's the old man. The rest have been killed, executed, crucified. 
only John is left. And he's writing during times of great persecution. To whom did John write? It seems that John was writing to the Greeks. And he's writing to the Greeks about John chapter 1 and verse 1, the Logos. John chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the word, and as I'm sure you know, the Greek word for that word, word, is Logos, L-O-G-O-S. Now let me tell you just a wee bit about the, about the background, which some of you may already know here. 400 years before Jesus was born, there was a Greek philosopher called Heraclitus, H-E-R-A-C-L-I-T-U-S, H-E-R-A-C-L-I-T-U-S, Heraclitus. Heraclitus, with his disciples, 400 years before Jesus, his Greek philosophy, looked around the world, and he saw that in the world there was order. It was an orderly world. The night followed day, and day followed night, and the seasons followed in proper order, and the sun rose, and the sun set, and the sun came out, and the star came out, and the moons came out, and the, the tides all worked to some principle of order. But it was holding, he saw, 400 years before Jesus, the whole universe together, some principle of order, which, some abstract principle of order, not just an abstract principle of order holding the world together. And Heraclitus, 400 years before Jesus, called that abstract principle of order, that abstract principle of order and reason which holds the world together, he called it the Logos. The Logos. 400 years before Jesus. He called it the Logos. And Heraclitus wrote in Ephesus. And that is most likely where John was at this time too, or was writing to and so John has a problem in his mind, 400 years later. He wants to get the gospel to the Greeks. He wants them to understand that Jesus is the Son of God. Those Greeks who believe in the Logos already, the Logos as the principle of order, which keeps the whole world together, this principle of cohesion, without which the world would be a chaos. He wants to get the gospel to these philosophical Greeks who believe in the Logos, the principle of order. How does he do it? Well, you see, if he'd written to them as Matthew had written to the Jews and said, Jesus, the Messiah is come, the Greeks didn't know the meaning of the word Messiah. They had never heard of it. That word Messiah, instead of being a means of communication, would have been a means of stoppage of communication. They wouldn't know who or what the Messiah was about. And so John, like a good preacher, like any good communicator, good evangelist, doesn't start from where he is. He doesn't go to the Greeks and say, you know, Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed has come, and then being surprised at the blank faces. He doesn't start where he is, but he starts like any good communicator of the gospel, where they are. And he goes to them and he says to them, you know the Logos? You've heard all about the Logos, this principle which keeps the world together. Let me tell you, the Logos is a person. The Logos is a divine person. You know all about the Logos. And you're right, the Logos is the principle of order holding the world together. But this bit you didn't know. The Logos is not just a principle of order. The Logos is a person, Jesus divine. That's what you call communication. That's what I said in one of our first lectures, that the, the content never changes of the message, but the communication must change. I was talking to somebody last night who works with the Wycliffe Bible translators, and the problems they have in communication. For instance, he was saying to me, um, in some of the Filipino countries, they have never ever seen bread. And they don't know what bread is and can't visualize it at all. How then do you communicate the truth to where Jesus said, I am the bread of life? What they do, they say, Jesus said, I am the rice of life. 
That is a change in communication, but not a change in content. To go to these Filipinos and say, Jesus is the bread of life, blank space. How would they ever take the Lord's Supper? Because they never have bread, never see bread, never eat bread, don't know what bread is. So they take the Lord's Supper with rice, these Christian folk with rice. And why? The communication must change, but the content never changes. You see, and if we are going to be littlest in the wrong sense of the Bible, we would deprive these people of the Lord's Supper because they don't have bread. We say, you can't have the Lord's Supper. I'm afraid that's just something you never have. Okay, let's move on. So Jesus is the Logos, the divine principle who holds the world together. That's to whom John wrote to the Greek philosophers. You believe in the Logos, the principle of order holding the world together. Let me tell you who he is, this principle of order. You're right, there is a principle of order behind the universe. And that principle of order is a person, Jesus. The Logos. And we're just going to look at a wee bit here. Very, not going to do chapters 1 to 13 at all. We're just going to do a wee bit about the, the Logos. About four or five things, and I'll give them to you in heading so you can take them down. First of all, notice what he says here about Jesus, the Logos. Chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Logos. In the beginning was Jesus. That's the first heading. In the beginning was the Logos. In the beginning was Jesus. The way, way back before we were born, the way, way back before the manger, the way, way back before Mount Sinai, the way, way back before the creation of the world, Way, way, way back in the beginning, there wasn't blankness, there wasn't blackness, there wasn't emptiness, there wasn't a way, way back in the beginning, there wasn't an unending silence. A way, way back in the beginning, there was Jesus. That Jesus is the for always Christ, Jesus is the forever Christ, and Jesus is the eternal Christ. Jesus has always been there. There was never a time when Jesus was not there. This is the doctrine of the pre-existent Christ. Way, way, way back, there wasn't silence or emptiness, but there was Jesus, who has always been there. Never a time when Jesus was not there. The for always, the forever, the eternal Christ. So in the beginning was Jesus. And the Word, chapter 1 and verse 1, Jesus was God. It doesn't say that the Word was good. It doesn't say that Jesus was good or that Jesus was godly or godlike. It says that Jesus was God. And it says that Jesus was with God. Chapter 1 and verse 1, it's the third heading. That word with is not just a simple preposition of proximity. It's a word of closeness and intimacy and fellowship. That Jesus was close to the Father or in the bosom of the Father. <coughs> Way, way, way back now, just try and think of this, way, way back in time, to the time when there was no time, and all there was, there was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's all there was. Before the stars, before the angels, before the devil, before anything at all, before there was time or space. Way, way back, there was the, the eternal Father, the eternal Son, and the eternal Holy Spirit. That's all there was. And what was the Son doing with the Father through all these eternal years? The Son was enjoying the Father. And the Son was loving the Father. And the Father was loving the Son. And the Spirit was loving the Father. And the Father was loving the Spirit. What do you think was going on for these years and years and years? If you had along here, 
a great big black line representing eternity, then the creation of the world would be just a wee bit, or the creation of anything would be a wee bit like that in it, and the creation of man would be a wee dot in it. And for all this other bit here, here, what was going on? When there was just the Father, and just the Son, and just the Spirit, they were enjoying and loving one another. You see, sometimes you hear preachers say that um, something like, you know, um, the reason God created man because, was because God was lonely and he needed somebody to love. I hope you've not heard that kind of theology because it's not Christian. Folks sometimes say, and I've heard it preached, that the reason God created man was because God in his heart was lonely and he, in his loneliness, he needed someone to love. That might have been true if there had just been one. But the father wasn't lonely, for the father had the son. And the son wasn't lonely, for he had the person of the spirit. And the needs of the individual members of the Trinity were met in the other members of the Trinity. And that is why God has no needs. God wasn't lonely, he needed someone to love. The definition of God is that God needs nothing. God needs nobody. God doesn't need you or need me. God may want us and love us, but he doesn't need us. He is the altogether self-sufficient one, for all his needs are met in the other persons of his trinity. That's the God. Never dethrone God by saying, you know, God needs something. He doesn't need anything. Because all his needs are met in the other persons of his own selfhood. And it's because God is three in one that God can be loved. You see, if there had only been God the Father, yes, God would have needed someone to love. He would have had to create man. Because love needs someone to love. And he would have had to create man then. But the Father loved the Son. And the Son loved the Spirit. And the Spirit loved the Father. And there was no need for God to do anything or to create anyone at all. And so the Son was with God, being loved by God the Father and loving God the Father. Now it's an incredible thing that Jesus then in John's Gospel goes on to say this. Say this. Now, think of this eternal love between the Father and the Son. Before anything was created, the Father was loving the Son. Then Jesus goes on and says to his disciples, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. There's never been a time when the Father didn't love the Son. There's never been a time when the Son didn't love you. The Father could not love the Son more, could he? The Son couldn't love you more. For the Son loves you with the same measure as the Father has loved and loved and loved and loved the Son. Because away, way back in eternity, when there was only the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Son was with the Father. The Father was with the Son. A reciprocal relationship of love. So, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, secondly, and the Word was with God in the bosom of the Father. And also it says there, chapter 1 and verse um, 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Stanley Jones, a missionary of a past generation, says that these are the greatest word, words in all human literature. The Word, eternal, uncreated, the uncreated Word, became flesh and dwelt among us. But Jesus, in the words of Charles Wesley, in one of his great Christmas hymns, God contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man. This eternal word, who'd always been the uncreated one, in fellowship with the Father, God contracted to a span, 
incomprehensibly made man. As another modern day preacher put it, God, 18 inches long. That's what Wesley was saying. The modern preacher just putting it in 20th century language, Wesley wrote in 18th century. God contracted to a span. God, the eternal God, 18 inches long. The Word, the Word, became flesh. Jesus, a wee totty boy, tottering around, tottering around on his little rubbery legs and falling on the floor of his father's carpenter's shop and sweeping the shavings off his wee legs and his wee knees. The eternal word, you see, became flesh. His little rubbery legs and falling around. God contracted to a span incomprehensibly made man. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. I notice chapter 1 and verse 11, the next heading. He came to that which was his own. He came. See these two words, he came? Incredible words. He came. The Jesus, the eternal word, the uncreated one with all these eternities in the bosom of the Father, sharing the Father's love. He looked at this little world of ours, which is really only a little particle of interstellar dust. He looked at it, a little particle, a dirty, grubby little tennis ball in cosmic space, that's the planet Earth. And he looked at it, and he saw a fool of afraid, anxious men and women wandering round in circles, wringing their hands and not knowing where to go or what to do or where to turn to. And he came. He came. He didn't abandon the world, but he came. He wasn't indifferent to the world, but he came. He didn't treat this little particle of interstellar dust, the planet Earth, with contempt, but he came. He came to his own, his own because it was his own world. Notice chapter 1 and verse 3. Through him all things were made. He came to his own world, for he'd made it. Before Jesus ever made a plough, he'd made the planets. Before Jesus ever made a stool, he'd made the stars. He came to his own. Before he ever made a plough as a carpenter, he made the planets. Before he'd ever made a stool, a seat, he'd made the stars. He made the straw on which he laid his head. He made the cross on which he died. He came to his own, for it was a world which he himself had created. In the beginning was the Word, firstly. The Word was God, secondly. And the Word was with God, thirdly. And the Word became flesh, fourthly. Fifthly, He came to this little particle of interstellar dust. He came. He looked at the loneliness of man, and He didn't remain, but He came. And He came to His own, because lastly, he had created it at all. It all was his own. And in John chapter 3 and verse 16, in that well-known verse, Jesus says this, or the writer says this, For God so loved the world. And that word, so loved, means, oh, love, that there is a soul in the heart of God. There is an O oh in the heart of God. That God just doesn't love the world. He so loves the world. He oh so loves the world. And Calvary is the ache of God for a lost world. Calvary is the O oh of God for a lost world. 
Calvary is the soul of the world for a lost world. Calvary is a historical demonstration in time of the pain that God always feels for folk. Calvary is a demonstration in time of the pain which is always in the heart of God. God is always so loving the world. God is always all loving men and women. There is a pain in the heart of the eternal. A pain for people. For people. For the redemption of ordinary men. And it was that pain for people which brought Jesus the eternal word. When he looked at the little dirty, grubby tennis ball of the planet Earth, full of lost men, it was that oh so love, that pain for people, that brought Jesus down to Earth. We'll stop there. Let's pray together. God and our Father, we we wonder the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit always there and then he came and he became flesh may the the all which is in the heart of God be in our hearts as well in Jesus name